Okay, so switching gears a little bit from ethnicity to gender, but still on human capital investment. Uh, Belinda Archibong, this is co-authored work with my, my co-author, Francis Anan at Georgia State University. Uh, so essentially, we're going to look at the impact of climate-induced disease on gender gaps in education. And so we started out this project by saying there's been a lot of investment in trying to close this primary enrollment gap, right? So gender gap in, in primary school enrollment. So the, the OECD uh, released a report, I think last year, a few years ago, basically stating that, you know, it's great, we've closed the gender gap in primary school enrollment as a result of all of these uh, free primary education programs in developing countries, but we still have this very pers persistent gap in completion rates, right? So educational attainment, this is the, the kind of uh, uh, male years of education on the X axis, female average years of education on the Y axis. This is a 45 degree line. And you see that a lot of the poorer countries is that the blue diamonds over down here are to the right of this 45 degree line, right? So you, know, you still have a situation where you know, men, boys still have more years of education completed than women in poor developing countries. So we said, okay, why is the reason? Well, what is the reason for this? You have all of this investment in education. You have all of this investment in closing the, the, the enrollment gap. Why do you still have this persistent gap in educational attainment? So I'm from Nigeria. My co-author, Francis, is from Ghana. And we've all heard stories growing up about, for instance, when people were sick in the household, who got to stay home from school? It was the girls, it was the women, right? So my mother tells me these stories all the time. So we said, okay, you have a, a kind of double burden here where you have a situation where you have low, uh, educational attainment, you also have this gender gap in educational attainment, and you have a disease burden in many of these poorer countries, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, right, in the tropics. So here is these countries in yellow. This is, these are these 23 countries in Africa that are part of this meningitis belt, right? So they are countries that are frequently exposed to meningitis epidemics. The cycle differs per country, three to 14 years, depending on the country. And we said, okay, what happens if you are in one of, these, one of these countries in this belt and you're exposed to disease and you have this, this, uh, this kind of education problem as well. What happens, what is the effect of the disease? What is the effect of the, the epidemic on the gender gap in education and attainment? So that's what we do. So we said, okay, let's look at the evidence from one, uh, one country, which is Niger. So one of the poorest countries in the world, uh, very low rates of education and attainment. This is from 2010, about two years of education uh, on average, and you see this gender gap between men and women, 2.8 years completed for males versus 1.5 years for women, lower than the Sub-Saharan African average, and of, uh, and of course, uh, also lower, Niger is also lower um, uh, than the world average as well. So we said, okay, what is the contribution of this? this I'll, I'll talk about the climate aspect, right? So this is a disease that is driven by the dry season, the Hamatan season for people who know Africa. Um, I guess this is a Lots of people here know Africa, but the Hamatan season in, in Africa drives this meningitis epidemic. So what is the impact of this, this, this climate-induced disease uh, on this persistent gender gap in educational attainment? So just a preview of our results. All we're going to do is look at evidence from a quasi-experiment. So this is, you know, you have this sudden health shock, right? Sudden epidemic that happens in 1986 in Niger. Uh, we're going to show you that the Hamatan season, the dry season, characterized by high wind speeds, high dust concentrations, lower temperatures, really very strongly predicts this meningitis epidemic. So this is evidence that comes from the environmental health literature. And we're going to show this econometrically with regressions as well. Uh, and what we find is that higher meningitis exposure during the epidemic really reduces the years of education uh, for girls who were school going aged, right? So primary school going aged, secondary school going aged as of the time of the epidemic. So these are girls between about the ages of six and 20 when the epidemic hits. So we're going to show that in a cohort study. And the magnitude of the effect is something like three to 4% reduction in years of education for girls relative to the mean. Um, so we're going to, add, you know, we're going to show with, with some evidence that we think that one primary mechanism here is that there are income effects, right? So this is a health shock, a sudden meningitis exposure um, for the household. It, you, I'll show you some evidence that it's quite costly to treat, not just in terms of the direct costs from you know, treating uh, with, with vaccines, but also in terms of the opportunity costs from you know, lost days of work, lost days of school, et cetera, foregone income for the household. Um, I'm, I'm also going to show you that because of these income effects, it seems that one, one thing that's happening here is that in this context where you have this bride price tradition, right? So when women are married, there's a transfer of income from the groom's family to the bride's family. What happens is that parents who are, who are then liquidity constrained, who experience this health shock that is an income shock to the household, are selling off their daughter, okay, selling off, marrying off their daughters at earlier ages, right? So they're, they're in exchange for this bride price. So, so that's why we're, we're going to show you that the age at first marriage falls pretty significantly by about a year from 15 to 14 in these epidemic uh, uh, affected areas. 
I will skip over the conceptual framework, but again, income effects, income shock, the health shock is this sudden, you know, this income shock to the household. Uh, and, and then we have this marriage response. So tell you a little bit about the meningitis belt and this meningitis epidemic. We look at Niger, which is this country right here. 95% of Niger's population rests in this meningitis belt. So this is this area in dark orange. So 95% of the population is here. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, three to 14 years is about the cycle for, for Niger. It's a sudden, sudden event. You don't know exactly when it'll hit, but when it hits, it's pretty devastating. Um, what is meningitis? Uh, so infection of the lining of the brain. So very nasty. You get you know, stiffness, fevers. Um, in the worst case is neurological damage and death uh, caused by this bacterium. The epidemiology is quite complex. So only recently are the environmental health people now trying to understand what actually drives these epidemics um, uh, in, in this region. Uh, and they have argued that the hamad and shown that the hamatan season, the dry season, I mentioned high wind speeds, high dust concentrations, explain something like 25 to 30 percent of the variation in, in meningitis in Niger during epidemic years. Uh, another thing to note is that while there are vaccines, there have been limited effectiveness of the vaccines over the years because this this bacterium, Neisseria meningitis, tends to mutate with every epidemic. So. It's really, you know, it's kind of a terrible shock that happens, sudden episode, because you can have the vaccine, but still get the, 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 uh, the illness. Um, in terms of the epidemics, there have been eight, six epidemics. So this is from data from the WHO, World Health Organization, six epidemics from 1986 to 2008. We look at the, the earliest recorded one, which is 1986, which had about 15,823 cases per 100,000 population with a, a mortality rate about, of about 4%. So who's affected? Young children and teenagers are particularly vulnerable to infection, which is a really big deal for a country like Niger, where the median age has remained about 15 years for the last decade. So a very young population that's vulnerable to this, uh, to this epidemic. Uh, another thing that's going to be important for our identification of the effect of meningitis epidemic on the gender gap in education is the fact that you have limited inter-district migration in Niger. Right? So you have migration going down to Nigeria um, or going up here to, I think this is Libya, up here. Uh, during, for instance, the droughts, et cetera. But you, within the country, you have limited inter-district inter migration. So what we're going to do is identify the impact of individual exposure to the 1986 epidemic based on where you live, your district exposure to the meningitis epidemic. So we, have, we only have data for, for meningitis cases at the district level. So that's what we're going to use to identify um, exposure. So why do I think this is primarily a, an income effect story? So I mentioned that the health costs of treating meningitis during the epidemic is quite high, right? So we don't have data from Niger, but we do have some data from neighboring Burkina Faso, which is also in the meningitis belt. And here, households are spending something like 34% of per capita GDP on treating meningitis and follow-up, you know, kind of costs associated with meningitis during an epidemic year. So 34% of per capita GDP is pretty significant. So we think that, you know, this is a, this is a, a pretty significant income effect um, for households. Uh, in terms of the vaccines, right, so they are free. the vaccines are supposed to be free, but oftentimes people pay for the vaccines because there isn't asymmetric information between healthcare workers and individuals about whether it's free or not, and then, you know, you have that. So let me tell you a little bit about the data that we use. We are going to use meningitis cases from the WHO, um, and we are going to use DHS data um, on years of education completed from 1992 and 1998 as our outcome variable. So we have individuals across the country, across all 36 districts of the country. Um, and essentially what we're going to do is, is a cohort study. So say, let's look at the people who would have been at the age to be in school, right? Not necessarily in school, but school going aged as of the time the epidemic hit. So these are the people born between 1960 and 1992. Um, we'll look at the primary school age population that is between six and 12, the secondary school age population between 13 and 20. And as kind of a control cohort, not, not a control exactly, but a control cohort, we will look at the non-school grain age population, which is the zero to fives when the epidemic hit. Um, so just, you know, background on Niger, about 20 million people is quite homogenous in terms of religion and ethnicity, um, over 50% Hausa, I think something like, depending on the source, 98% Muslim, uh, and also quite poor. Okay, so this is what the, the kind of epidemic looks like in 1986, or the distribution of the meningitis cases from the epidemic looks like in 1986. So these are the districts in Niger. Um, this is 1986, mean weekly cases. So we have something like 15 cases on average per week per 100,000 population um, down here in this, in this, in this district, in these southern districts in Niger. Um, so just to give you an idea of the difference, so you look at a, a non-epidemic year like 1990, and this is the 
this is the distribution. The cases are, are much lower on average, something like three cases um, per, uh, per week. So it, just to give you a graphical uh, kind of visual of, of just the difference in meningitis uh, variation in the country during an epidemic year versus a non-epidemic year, this is Niger epidemic year 1986. These are the districts, the 36 distri districts in the country, uh, and this is a non-epidemic year in blue. So very kind of very different outcomes there. So I mentioned how we construct the cohorts. We're going to look at school going age populations, primary school going age in 6 to 12, 13 to 20, and then the non-school going age population, 0 to 5s, during this 1986 epidemic year. Um, so Niger has free primary education. The, man the mandatory school going uh, start age is age 7. So we'll show, or I might not get time to show it, but you know, we do a bunch of robustness checks. We change the kind of uh, age category cutoffs, marginal changes to the age categories, no difference in the results. Um, and so what, we really, what we're expecting to see is that we should see the effect of the meningitis exposure for this school going age population, but not for the non-school going age population. And our, our framework you know, is a pretty, kind of pretty straightforward. For people who do regressions, difference in difference, you have district fixed effects, year fixed effects, year of birth fixed effects, you cluster your standard errors by district. We you know, try to be as robust as possible in, try, in, in looking at basically trying to estimate this uh, uh, gamma, which is this gender gap. Uh, in an educational attainment. So first set of results, just focus on 1B. So the outcome is, is, is this case cohort variable or case cohort outcome. Um, and this is the 3 to 4%, so ages 6 to 12, ages 13 to 20 that I was talking about earlier, right? This reduction in years of education for girls and no effect for this no, non-school going age population. Um, so robustness to different specifications there. Um, let me skip over that. We also do, a, as a robustness, kind of, we look at a non-epidemic year, 1990, as a test. And here, again, you don't see an effect for this primary school grain age category. Um, you do see kind of a positive, uh, we haven't got a chance to explain this, but it's positive effect on this non-school grain age category in a non-epidemic year. Um, and then this is, this, you see an effect for the 13 to 20s, but this is kind of some of the category from the 6 to 12s in 1986, spilling over to 1990. Um, so just to show you, you know, we, we did an I, uh, instrumental variable uh, analysis. I won't go into all of that, just to show you the first stage that Hamatan, the, the kind of previous year, dust and winds, very strongly predicts uh, our meningitis cases during the epidemic year, right? So this is IF statistics, very high um, there. So I won't show you the second stage, but the second stage results in the IV also you know, they go along with the OLS results and the diff and diff. Um, okay, let me talk a, a little bit about the mechanism. So I mentioned that I th we, we think that a major mechanism is this early marriage story, right? So income effects, 34% of per capita GDP. One of the reasons that we think that this is an early marriage story is that Niger has the highest rate of early marriage in the world, right? So 75% of girls in Niger are married before the age of 18. So one of the things that you, know, you can think of is, well, this is a, it's, it's a, it's a disease, a health shock, it's a covariate shock, because the whole country is experiencing this meningitis epidemic. So who's, you know, if, who's marrying who, right? The, the man's family is also experiencing this shock, right? So how are they getting married um, to these girls? So one of the things that we said is like, one response is that you are marrying across, and we'll show some evidence on the wealth, the wealth category. So slightly, it seems like older, richer men are marrying you know, poorer, younger girls. Um, and also, Niger is a polygamous country. Right? So we thought this was interesting. We had this in the, in the paper. We had to move this to the appendix because of measurement error. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean in a minute. So this is the DHS data for men and women, the women's sample and the men's sample. So this is the DHS women's sample for school going age women in 1986 and in 1990. So what I want you to take away here is that when you ask the women, right? So we said, OK, this is not one-to-one -one matchings in terms of marriage. It's potentially one-to-many matchings. So you can imagine where a richer guy is able to marry more than one wife during the epidemic year. Right? So when you asked, so we wanted to see if there was an effect on the number of wives. So when you ask the women, how many wives does your husband have? They say up to seven. When you ask the men, how many wives do you have? It's always top quoted at four, right? Because in Niger, it's a Muslim country, you can only marry by law up to four wives, right? So anyway, measurement error, but when you look at the women's sample, there is an, a positive, you know, significant increase in the number of wives um, during the epidemic year. When you look at the men's sample, there's no effect, but anyway. So we thought this was important because, of course, you, there's a large literature showing this very strong correlation between the age of first marriage and educational level. This is just a correlation. We confirmed this in our data set, specifically for, uh, especially for this, this um, 
school going age women um, in both the epidemic year 1986 and 1990, the, 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 the kind of magnitude of this effect is pretty, is pretty stable and significant. Men sample, it, it kind of loses the effect between uh, an, an epidemic year and a non-epidemic these, these are just purely correlations, you know, just showing that the correlation between years of education and age at first marriage. And, and this is the, the, the kind of marriage reduction story, right? So this is up here is the um, hazard rates for uh, women during the epidemic year, 1986, so who were school going aged. So basically what this is showing, so this is the high meningitis affected districts above, above the national mean and the kind of low meningitis affected districts in yellow. All this is showing is that you ha women um, are twice as likely to marry younger during the epidemic year than a non-epidemic year. So these, these women who are school going aged, right? So econometrically, this is, I, I mentioned, it's something like a year reduction. In, in the age at first marriage from about 15 years to 14 years on average. So we do a bunch of robustness checks, I'm done. Um, so it's not rainfall, people say if it's a rainfall, it's, there are no con it's not like there's a concurrent rainfall shock going on when the epidemic hits. And we also find that the effect of this meningitis on the, the gender gap in, in sorry, the, the kind of age at first marriage results um, is concentrated at the more asset constrained households, so the, the lower wealth quintiles as well. So I'm concluding, in conclusion, what we find is that the gender gap widens during the, menin the, the meningitis epidemic year. So again, really, I think from a policy point of view, pushes us to think about the, the, the kind of joint relationship between education and health in, in trying to determine um, policy, especially in the, the, the presence of future climate change, which is supposed to worsen disease environments in the tropics. Um, so I mentioned that we're doing future work on trying to understand the marriage market implications as well. Okay, thank you.